Gadget UK here again. Um, just a quick video on the Atari 520 STE. Um, I want to show you a few things. I'll do a teardown of this. Um, the floppy drive, I just, I've done a fix for on this. It's uh, got a Sony, uh, I forget the exact model number, I'll have a look when I get inside there. It's an MFP something, I think. Um, they suffer from a uh, problem with electrolytic caps drying out. Um, funnily enough, it's been in storage for a while, listen, as I turn it up and down, you can hear something loosen it. There's a screw or something loosen there, so I need to go in there anyway just to remedy uh, whatever that's uh, whatever that screw is that's uh, rolling around in there. Um, the other thing I've done to this particular model, uh, you can see I had a switch there to toggle between 4 meg and 1 meg. Um, not absolutely required, there is software available you can use that um, uses the MMU to um, you know, switch it into a mode where it will see the sims as 1 meg, so you can trick it that way, but I prefer a hardware sort of option so you can just, you know, switch between the two there, because some games, um, when you go over 1 megabytes of RAM, some games won't work, and it's to do with the allocation of the video RAM um, buffer being in the, the top of the first meg or something, as soon as you've got 4 meg, you start getting problems I think. So uh, I'll just quickly get this uh, apart and uh, have a look inside. So in order to get this uh, thing to bits, it's just the same as the STFM and stuff, uh, it's exactly the same sort of case layout really. Um, you've got a screw there, screw there, screw there, and then a couple at the back, yeah, you've got one, two, three, four. You also probably want to take out these two if you, you want to get the, in fact it's those three actually if you want to get the floppy drive out, which uh, I will do. Once you get the lid off, one of the things you'll notice that's different um, with the STE over the STFM, uh, this piece of shielding is obviously a bit is more elongated. In fact, it comes comes down further uh, the way here as well. Let's move the keyboard out of the way. Um, well, perhaps it doesn't. I think it usually just gets cut off about here. Um, and basically, you've got your ramp under here. So if I just uh, move this piece of shielding. There you go, so you can see I've got four 30 pin sims here. Um, if you want to, you know, if you've got a 512, you know, 520 uh, F, uh, STE and you've just got half a meg, you'll just have typically two 256k sims in here. So you could add another two 256k to give you a, a meg, or you could, just, you know, remove them all, stick some one meg sims in there to, to give you four meg. You can have two one meg sims to give you two meg. You can also have two one meg sims and two half, uh, two two five six k sims to give you two and a half meg. So you've got a few different combinations there. But to be honest, whatever you, if you've got an ST, I just rip it, and you've not got four meg, I just you know rip the lid off, rip that piece of shielding off, take those four out, and get four um, thirty pin uh, one meg sims from uh, eBay. You want seventeen on a seconds or faster? Sixties will be all right, but seventies uh, are what are typically used in these. I think eighties will probably work fine as well. To be fair. Um, and the parity's not, it's not important. I think these are probably nine chip, are they? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so these have probably got parity on there. It's one of those, if a system needs parity chip, obviously you need the parity chip on it. If it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if it's there. It's just an, an additional thing, it doesn't get used. So, I worked out where that screw was from. It's from someone been tinkering in this before, as you can see. Got a, a screw missing there, so that's the screw that's floating around. So, very glad I actually spotted that. Um, I can now find that screw and uh, stick it back in. Right, so I've managed to get the uh, floppy drive out of there now, so if I just uh, I'll zoom in a bit just so you can see the model number. It's a Sony MPF110-03. So, yeah, these are quite common, these Sony drives and the STE. Um, they're also, you will find, the same, not exactly the same model, but sometimes it's a very similar model in the Amigas, Commodore Amigas as well. Um, it might be the 500 plus, I'm not really sure. Um, I, I do know that a uh, few people have reported seeing the Mini Amigas um, in the past and it's the same fault. But um, yeah, you, apologies for the, it's a bit of a mess this. Um, there was no easy way to mount these. This is the smallest electrolytics I could get, you know, wet type. But originally, where this was mounted on here, you would have a little SMD electrolytic and the same, if I just move back into shot here, the same with the, uh, there was this little, um, SMD electrolytic there on the probably on the 12 volt supply input could be the 5 volt I'm not sure um, but in any case that the, the, that first cap that I showed you that is what causes the problems in these Sony drives um, and typically what happens is when you 
you know, you switch the thing on, put a disc in, and it sounds like it's really going for it. It's, it's really much faster. It sounds like the rotation's faster than normal. So I'm guessing this has got something to do with the rotation um, uh, timing. Potentially even, um, if I just move a bit lower down to shot here, potentially this here and this use of this little magnet that's on the side of there regards the rotation time and I'm guessing it's associated with that part of the circuit um, it looks like it probably is, I haven't, I've got, I can't find schematics for this and I haven't really haven't had the patience and time to mess around and follow exactly to see where that goes but what I do know is when that electrolytic, the SMD electrolytic there is uh, dried out um, it's something like, and it's a very low value by the way, it's something like 0 0.47 microfarad it's not even you know, half a microfarad, but it's pretty low um, and when that's gone, like I say, this will spin potentially as much, it sounds like twice as fast, I've just had to guess, I'd say it's, it seems to sounds to be spinning twice as fast, it sounds like it's going to take off, um, as soon as you replace that cap out, suddenly it works, you start reading discs again, so that's an interesting one for people, um, I know not many people uh, tend to bother repairing floppy drives, but uh, I'm one of these, that, you know, if I can try and repair something I will, um, rather than just swap it out, I, I, I don't really like swapping things out, there's very few other things to go uh, wrong, on this uh, on these floppy drive boards, other than the mechanical parts and the heads and stuff, um, yeah, there's tons of tons of little small passives and things on there, but they're not likely to fail. I think the biggest the thing that's going to kill for these drives ultimately is the motors, the heads. You know, um, it's that sort of thing. It's the mechanics, really. Uh, there's not what you can do with uh, wear and tear on some of those uh, physical components. Um, so something else uh, worth mentioning, I guess, while I'm here, is uh, as I touched upon earlier, the, the, the switch there for the the uh, four mag uh, switch between one and four mag. Um, probably not going to be able to see this. Let's see if I can just rotate this round the other way. I really don't want to take the shielding off, to be honest. Um, if someone gets desperate, you can always ask me. But the, what I've done, you know, if you look back at the STFM, um, my STFM videos in terms of the teardown I did, where I covered briefly how I did the this uh, aim this switch here for between one and four meg it was thanks to Alison the late Alison Chalice um, one of the things Alison found is I think it's pin 18 on these sims 30 pin sims pin 18 is the A9 pin and if that A9 pin is not connected to the MMU on the ST uh, which I think is pin 64 for memory serves um, it detects the memory as one meg um, Incidentally, it's not that's not exactly true. Uh, sorry, it's, that's not entirely true. So that four meg, if you've got the A9 open circuit, so that the MMU is not connected, yes, it will treat four one meg sims as four two five six k sims. Um, but that same thing stands true, or that same uh, drop, if you like, in the, the, the memory size stands tr holds true if you put four two five six k sims in there. It will treat them at a quarter of their original size. You end up with something like 256k or something. It's strange how it works. So it's not quite that the MMU sees it, sees them as a particular size of sim. It just accesses them in a certain way where it's not using all of the address pins, obviously. So you get a smaller quantity uh, of RAM there. So um, yeah, pin 18. If you're going to do this yourself, you want to trace as I did, but tr tr trace from pin 18 on these sims. Um, and there's some resistors. I just, I, 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 you know, it's like I say, I really should tear this down, but I don't want to go to that level. I haven't got the time really. But just under here, there's a load of resistors. And if you use continuity on your meter and check from the ends nearest the sims here, you know, because there'll be there'll be a point over here, you know, on this side, and there'll be a point obviously across the other side of the resistor. So the point to the side of the resistor that are nearest the memory. If you just test with continuity to pin 18 in your sim slot, eventually you'll get a beep, where something like around one ohm or something, so you know you found the right resistor. And effectively, this switch is just opening, you know, op uh, open circuit there, so that the resistor is no longer connected to pin 18. Um, and I think they're, they're all the same. You only got the one resistor coming to it, which goes to pin 18 on all four of these. So, you know, it's, like I said, the switch is making that open circuit um, when you switch it one way. Um, but at the same time as making it open circuit, it grounds pin 18 on the sim. So, you know, 18 here is no longer connected to the MMU pin 64, it's connected to ground all, on all four pin 18s of these. And then you switch it the other way and it just can connects them up as normal. So you've got, you know, the, the output from that resistor into pin 18, which would go to pin 18 on all four. 
uh, and that's the difference between one mega and four mega. So it's pretty straightforward. It's like I say, you just need to use continuity. Test from 18 to the edges of the resistors there until you get uh, pretty much a short and you've worked out. Then you'll have found which resistor it is that goes to pin 64 on the MMU. So pretty straightforward. Um, same sort of things I said really about the STFM, uh, you know, weak points in these, you know, floppy drive already touched upon, yeah, there they go. And, uh, you know, there's other things you can do with these as well, you know, it's worth cleaning the heads, you know, take the shielding off, uh, I don't want to do it now, but take the shielding off, get a cotton bud, get out any of the dust and stuff, particles that are in, the stuff that are in there, put some oil on the little bar, the, wor the worm screw sort of thing where the head uh, assembly, you know, zooms up and down, get some sort of uh, uh, lithium based oil or something onto that. Um, and clean the heads with, uh, just use some cotton buds, dip them in isoprop and you know, what I do is, it's a bit hard to show really, I'll see if I can I'll do this on another video in future but I just, you know, just gently rub the, the heads and don't be afraid of just lifting the top head a little bit with your finger, you don't want to bend it but you can certainly lift it up as, you know, as far as it will move um, without uh, bend, you know, bending the assembly there and you won't have a problem at all, you know um, one other thing you can do, and I, I, you know, I, I've not done it for many many years now but when I was in the trade um, you can find that sometimes with constant use, you get magnet, you get particles off the disc that work the way onto the heads, and the heads become sort of magnetised. Um, you need to demagnetise them, so you can get tape head demagnetizer type things. You know, a few quid from China, for eBay, etc. And you just sort of move them, switch them on. You can feel it vibrating as you move it near something that's got a magnetic type. Uh, you know, it's iron or whatever. You'll find that that you can feel, you know, a vibration on the demagnetizer. So you know you're doing the, you know, you're in the right area kind of thing. And just move it in a circular motion around the heads and gradually, gradually pull it away while you're moving in circles. Um, and uh, yeah, clean the heads, give it another try, and you can find that sort of, I don't know, nine times out of ten, you probably get them working unless you've got a problem with one of the motors or that you know the heads are just completely well and truly gone um, it's unusual to not be able to you know restore one of these drives um, in that way so uh, yeah keyboard identical to the STFM uh, this one's got a couple of keys there that are a bit faded on you can see the control and the A it's like a bit yellow I don't know someone's been you know whether those keys have been continuously used it looks that way to me or been replaced from another keyboard because uh, you got the other Got a few more odd ones like that one there, it's a little bit yellowed, uh, a couple on the numpad here, a little bit yellowed. So you can treat that sort of thing with some H2O2 hydrogen peroxide. So I'll probably do that at some point in the future, just pop these off, stick them um, in some uh, H2O2, something like, I don't know, between 3 and 12%, um, leave it in the sun for a few hours, and then uh, you know take them out, rinse them off, and they should be good to go. These just clip off, by the way, you know, you can just use a screwdriver or something just to clip these off, you've got to be careful. Um, you don't want to break them. Um, same sort, exactly the same problem actually, common problem um, with these, um, the joystick port and mouse port. You can find that um, it's very, very common. So whether they, they join the PCB here on the other side, obviously they're soldered on. From cause, Just because of the angle you know, of approach here, where you're sticking these in and pulling these out from underneath the STE, uh, e, um, you put in torque on that on that on this point right here, where these, you know, they're soldered onto the thing there. And as a result, the solder joints break it's a very, 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 very common problem. If you've not had this done, in fact, I was going to say, if you've not had this done on your STE, um, it's just a matter of time, seriously. I'd be amazed if it's not already been done once or twice in the life of the STE um, already, unless you've had it from new. Um, it really, it largely depends upon how often things are connected and disconnected here. If you've got extension cables, you know, the little extenders that come out, um, you know, three or four pound off eBay or whatever, that just allow you to, you know, plug things in at the other end rather than just keep, you know, to keep dis disconnect them from the keyboard, then you're probably okay. But if you, you know, just, if, just for argument's sake, if, you know, it's had a quite a bit of use and people have frequently unplugged the mouse to plug a joystick in, etc. You'll find that, uh, yeah, occasionally you'll find, you know, a button won't work, a direction won't work, your mouse isn't working, and that's all it is. Those, you need to be soldering. And, um, I won't go into it too much, but if you watch the STFM teardown video I did explain about, you know, how you do that, and all you basically, it involves just removing all of the, the screws and things on here and pulling out all the key, uh, the rubbers underneath and stuff, and then just giving it a clean, resolder the points and uh, reassemble. So it's straightforward things, a whole load of parts and things you've got to make sure you don't lose, don't lose the screws, don't lose the plungers, but yeah, it's worth watching that uh, STFM teardown video if you want a bit more information on that. Uh, perhaps one day I'll find the time to tear one of these down and actually show you the process, but it, it is straightforward, you've just got to make sure you don't lose anything. Um, that's pretty much it really. Um, I'll reassemble this now. While I'm reassembling that, I'll just uh, mention a few things as well. One of the reasons why Pete, why you would want an ST perhaps over an STFM or an STF uh, 
is, uh, yeah, at Atari, um, we're trying to keep up with Commodore, effectively. Um, the Amiga 500 was sort of outselling the ST um, in various uh, places, uh, well, all places, I think. It was, the ST was still pretty popular, certainly in Europe. It wasn't as um, popular in the, in the States because, uh, you know, marketing and stuff didn't seem to be working very well over there. Um, and probably the Commodore really was its biggest competitor, which was doing a lot better. Um, but this was, a, you know, Atari's answer to the sort of 500, really, you know, the, the, the deficiencies, things that they'd lacked, you know. What, one of the things that developers always said, you know, that you, you didn't get smooth scrolling and stuff. Um, so, you know, additional hardware was added in here. Um, you got additional sprite, um, what's it called? Scroll, you got hardware scrolling capability, which was never um, in the original STFM models and stuff. Um, and they also added uh, DMA sound as well, um, which you know that was a that was a nice improvement, but um, it needed a bit more really, and that was ultimately why the ST failed. It was. Too little difference really between you know the original stock ST models um, and what the ST brought to the table was just not enough. Uh, but it did also bring these um, new joystick ports on the side here as well. Um, they look like 15 pin, I think they're probably 15 pin HD, you know, they're, they're like the uh, VGA type connectors as far as I can see there. Um, I wasn't aware at the time, you know, when this when these, this was around, you know, of any joysticks you could get for this. There probably were, I've never seen hardly any on eBay, they're pretty hard to get hold of. But what I do know is you can get the, if you use a Jaguar um, pad, the Jaguar pads fit and work perfectly in these, so um, it's probably worth getting one of those. There's probably not a massive amount of games that support, that support these analogue ports here, um, but I do know that uh, PP, uh, the guy on the, P Peter Patari is called, from, uh, he's on Atari age, he, uh, he also spends time on uh, Atari forum as well. He's um, been doing some of the um, hard disk, uh, you know, hacks and things, you know, conversions of floppy based games to work with uh, Ultra Satan and stuff, you know, to boot off your hard disk. And at the same time as he's now started putting support for his analog joysticks, uh, I think he's done Golden Axe as one of his first ones. So it's worth having a look at that, it's worth uh, getting a, a, a jag pad, I guess, if you're in, if you want to, you know, if you're a completionist. I'll probably get one at some point, but right now I've got uh, too many other things to be focusing on, really. Um, so, just get the shielding back on. I guess one final thing to note while I'm just reassembling this here um, is the case as well. Um, I don't know how well this is coming out on camera, but this is much more like um, the original colour when they shipped, uh, when the STFM shipped, in fact, in STF and like, all the different models, they were all this sort of grey. Um, but it's interesting, this has not been retrobrired, um, you know, it's, it's almost as old as the STFM I've got, you know, obviously the STFM is probably, F FM is probably three, four years older, um, whether that's got anything to do with it, I don't know, but um, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's not faded, the colour, the plastic has not gone yellow, those key, those few keys that I showed earlier um, have yellowed, um, but I think that's for a different reason, I think that's because they've been used. Um, you know, someone's originally smoked around this or something many years back or something, and those are the keys that have played the same game, and those particular keys have been used in the flight sim or something, you know, uh, uh, quite a lot, and that's why those ones have faded. Either that or have been damaged and someone's replaced those keys um, separately um, and that, from a different keyboard or something, I don't know. But um, the colour, you know, the colour of this um, STE is pretty much representative of how they were when they were new. It's not really faded at all. And that can't be said for my STFM. That's got that sort of greeny sort of look that uh, they have. Uh, I wonder if it's a green, yeah, it's not yellow, you think it did, yeah, sort of, it's more of a green, you got a sort of greeny colour. Um, but to be honest, I'm, I've got no interest in retrofitting the STFM because it's very even. Um, so it doesn't look, and because it's not yellow, it's sort of a greeny grey as such, it looks, um, you know, it's, it's more than presentable. Um, it's not got that sickly sort of yellow colour that you sometimes get. Someone's not used the original, the right screws on this as well. So I think it annoys me, I'm going to have to get another screw to replace that because that screw's just too small. Um, but anyway, it's pretty much back together there now. I'll give it a bit of a wipe down um, and probably put that back in storage for the moment. Um, Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.